on one hand, I always say like when we are hiring people, people always talk about culture fit. I like to talk about culture fitness, no? So it's important that a new hire is somehow or very much aligned with your company culture, but it's more important that you're going to allow that person also to challenge your culture. So it's kind of a cross-pollinization process. So the person needs to adapt to the culture and learn how we do things here, but we want the person also to influence us, to challenge us, to bring new tools, new ways of working. Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of the Loop Email Podcast. I'm very happy to say hello today to Gustavo Red City. Hello, Gustavo. Hi, Bosjan. How are you? Nice being here. Yeah. I'm very well. I am very well. Thank you. I understand you have a very lovely day in Chicago and it's very nice here in Ljubljana as well. Uh, just so that we understand, um, uh, Gustavo is, I mean, you're a leadership uh, uh, expert. You've been transforming leaders and teams for over 20 years. Um, you're the founder of, I read here, Libertionist. A liber- is that correct? Liberationist, yeah. Liberationist, uh, a change partner that liberates people from what's holding them back. And uh, you talk and you have a a medium channel with more than 24,000 subscribers. And you've been sort of helping companies like Verizon, PNG, uh, 20th Century Fox uh, to, um, you know, help them uh, build cultures that uh, make big uh, differences. Tell me, um, you're a change instigator, if I understand correctly. Can you expand on that? Can you tell our, our, our viewers and, and listeners to what that actually uh, uh, defines? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the most important thing is like, uh, I don't like the word consultant. So most of the work I do is consulting or coaching companies. But in the end, I believe that mo- consultants always think that they have the solution and they try to tell people how to work, right? In my case, I believe that people already have what it takes. That's why we call liberation is we unleash their best version. So for me, it's like I'm a spark that's going to start the fire. But in order to start a fire, you need something that's combustible. And people already have that. So for me, it's just kicking off the process and then taking letting the teams take it from there. Wow. And, and, and tell me, because we, we talk about um, teams and we talk about company culture, and I know you're a big fan of um, relationships and teams. Uh, you know, for me, it's, it's always the big question is how much time do you spend on actually working uh, with the team in, uh, in, in terms of making sure they work together uh, versus the day to day, as I call it? So, so how important is the team, the relationships between people in, in your mind, or how important should it be for, for the leader, for the modern leader uh, today? I think that relationships, it's key. Like, for example, when we talk about leadership, we come from a, from a tradition, like, and I'm talking about centuries of seeing leaders as individuals, right? But in today's world, we need to think of leadership as something collective. So it's a, it's a group of people that are leading a company or a team, not just one person. So for me, the relationship is key for many aspects. There's a lot of research that shows that, for example, when people get to know themselves really well, like among team members, teams that people uh, are really connected and, and they belong to the team, they are much more productive, much more creative and perform much better than those teams that people don't know their team members that well. Uh, on their hand, there's a lot of uh, uh, studies that show that no one can change the world alone. So when you find a partner uh, within the team, someone that can be your uh, go-to person, like uh, your your support, your complement, then your chances of achieving your individual goals uh, it increases like by 90%. So in the end, it's everything about relationships. So when we talk about the teams, for example, like a team is not just a unit, it's a collection of different relationships. You might have stronger relationships with certain team members than with another, but in the end, the sum of all those relationships is what make a team more powerful than others. But, but for me, talking about teams, and, and I totally get it, and I, I, I totally buy, I really do buy that concept, but, but in this world where everything is fast paced and people, you know, investors, yourself, whoever, there's a really strong sense of 
instant success, instant uh, results, instant um, execution. Whereas building relationships and building teams is is sort of a, a long term aspect. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long term uh, strategy, uh, mid term uh, uh, at best. So how do you sort of cope with that? You know, short term results versus building a strong team because relationships cannot be built uh, from day one. Do you sort of do you think it's more about how you pick the team? Is it more about how you change the team? Is it more about how you nurture those relationships and develop individuals within them? What makes that story, you know, how, how do you make that story fly fast enough to ensure uh, uh, that, you know, the results and, 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 and success comes um, uh, fast enough as well? No, absolutely. I think that I was thinking about a, a phrase that it's very old. I don't know who who said it first, which is "go slow to go fast." Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm an advocate of speed, right? But speed without purpose is basically you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Now, when people now say, "I work with a lot of large companies and they want to adopt this startup mindset of fail fast," no. So I tell them, no, you don't need to fail fast. You need to fail smart. So if we don't have the foundation of a team right, regardless if we're moving fast or slow, we're going to screw things up. It's like my wife is an architect, no? So for example, I learned that the most important ha- a part of a house or a building is the foundation. You cannot take shortcuts. If you don't build the right foundation, then a building or a house is going to collapse. You see what I'm saying? So that's critical for anything that you want to build. So when it comes to teams, I agree it's a long-term result, but you can do some very quick things to set the team in the right direction, but also make sure that you spend some time on a daily and weekly basis to build those teams. For example, like uh, Google did a lot of research recently about remote teams, right? They're part of the new, re- the new reality. Most people are working remotely m- more and more. And many teams are actually very remote or they have some central elements or central uh, team members, but then a lot of people that work in different locations. So one of the key realizations that Google, Google found out is that you need to spend time to build those personal relationships. It's key. So they suggest that, for example, you find a time to gather people uh, face-to-face, even if they work in different locations, at least once or twice or three times a year, they need to get together because that really uh, changes how people work. Also, they suggest that if you're having calls with people, video calls with people that are working from different uh, cities or countries, that you allow some time before the meeting kicks off to share some personal stuff. So there are many little things that you can do in the day-to-day that allows people to create that a, a emotional connection, that human connection, and then teams are going to be much more successful. But have you, have you in your experience in working with, um, with uh, these leaders and with these companies, have you never come into a situation where you saw this really high-paced uh, leader who is... I would call him too fast for the team. And I'm, I'm not trying to be negative, but it's like, you know, he doesn't give enough room for the team to develop uh, 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 at, at, at the tempo so that uh, as a whole, uh, the result would be better than, uh, you know, him just uh, uh, running very fast uh, and moving forward. Is that sort of not a challenge you see? Uh, you know, how do you... Uh, because there's there's normal situation. You, you bring in the best talent and you've got the best talent. You've basically got so many different profiles that building the relationship between those people is is you know takes time it does you need to have enough time and and in most of these environments everybody is focused to the outside world they're taking so how do you sort of persuade those kind of leaders that you know the team is important and it is the foundation it does and it matters how much time you spend with them uh how, how does that you know, how do you do that what, what are the actions uh, a leader like you tell a leader like that you know what makes the mindset change or tick? That's a great question. I think that this is weird because of my personal uh, situation, right? But I think that in most of the cases, I don't have to convince anyone. <laughs> 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 because usually they call me when they've been experimenting with different approaches and they're hitting the wall over and over and they realize that the team is not getting as far as they can. I mean, there's a lot of research that shows that 
over three quarters of CEOs across the globe think that their teams are underperforming. So basically that they know that their team, as you were saying, we have great talent, great conditions, we give them everything, but they're not giving their full potential. So most of the time when I'm engaged with a client is because they're already seeing, oh, something's going wrong and say, hey, can you fix it? You know? So that's why I'm, I self <laughs> call, I call myself like a change instigator. They call me like, oh, do something. And, okay. and usually there are some things that are like short term that you can affect and create a, 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 a huge impact really, really fast. Let me tell you something very, very basic. But if you ask your team to gather every, any day, right, and spend like, you know, let everyone spend a couple of minutes sharing what they do outside of work, their hobbies, what their, their personal values, what are the interests, the things that they want to do when they're not working, I can tell you that that's a very stupid, because it's very simple, but surprising conversation. Because people start to realize, I didn't know that you, Bosian, like to draw or paint or whatever, <laughs> and that you have, and that stuff creates immediately like curiosity that then people want to continue talking about that in other moments. So it creates, in the end, it's humans working with humans, right? That's the true of a uh, collaboration. Another thing that uh, we do, like for example, we do a lot of workshops that in a couple of hours you get people to accelerate those relationships. It's about sharing personal stories. You know, for example, you ask people to share something personal and then you ask other team member to retell that story in their own words and then they have to tell it in their first person. So it creates a lot of empathy because not only people are getting to know themselves better, but they're also practicing empathy, which is listening, but also being able to put yourself into someone else's story and feel the pain. Uh, there's another um, thing that we do that's really, really interesting, which is uh, building like accountability partnerships. So basically, you create like duos. You no, know? for me, this, the 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 relation between two people is the strongest that you can build because you can have a very strong relation mm-hmm. with one person. It's hard to have five simultaneous strong relationships. And that accountability partnership basically is a simple exercise. Yeah, we have it on our website with all the descriptions and tools that you ca- you define something that you want to change. I want to prove a particular behavior within a team. So I want to show up to meetings more prepared or on time. I want to start being more open-minded and listening to my colleagues' uh, points of view without interrupting, whatever. And then you set up some goals and define what kind of coaching do you need in order for you to change that behavior. And your accountability partner is going to be coaching you based on your style to help you achieve that. On their hand, that person is going to have their own particular goals, their own coaching needs, and you're going to help them. So it's going to be like a win-win relationship. We've been doing this for many, many years within different companies, and people love it because in the end, they find they don't need an external coach or their boss to help them they find this person that it's their go-to person, even when they, I mean, they have a shitty conversation with their boss, a project went south, they're facing some issues, whatever. They have this partner that they can go and talk and say, look, help me out. And the other way around. Interesting. But but going back to sort of, um, you know, your, uh, your, uh, you have a very nice situation. Uh, you know, they call you when they have a big problem. I, I envy you for that. Uh, but but uh, um, when you come into these situations, how much of the fixing is on the side of the team and how much is on the side of the CEO? How much is it a transformation of the CEO's mindset and, and his his view of the world? And how much is it then easier if that gets fixed well, uh, for the whole team, or is it the other way? Is it is it sort of, or is it more equal? I, I would say equal. I think this is uh, an amazing question because, like, uh, people don't want to address this issue, right? Usually, when we talk about changing an organ, transforming an organization, most senior leaders, let's say CEOs, uh, chief human resources officers, officers, or uh, COOs, they put the blame on people. Right. So when we face resistance, is it's a people issue. But in the end, whatever happens, it's a collective result of a relationship between these leaders and their teams. So to your point, if we want to introduce changes, both leaders and their team needs to change. 
and that's the, the biggest I, and that's something that I have to work a lot because usually when I'm having my first uh, interviews I usually talk to to the leaders and then I interview different team members I like to talk to your most recent employee uh, the oldest employee that's, that knows the culture better than anyone I want to talk to the top performer and the and the most rebellious and the, that people that no one wants to work with. So I, I usually talk to very different people to get a, a, a collective vision of the of what's going on, right? And by doing that, I realize that the CEOs tell us a story. It's what they think. Some cases they are right, but in many things they're working out of assumptions. But also they usually don't see their own flaws. So. Everything's about the others. The others need to do it. So I, I have fun. But then when I talk to people, I say, well, my CEO. So it's not one way or the other. You need to understand all the issues. But people, I always tell my clients, if the senior leader is not open to change and go through the same transformation, then I cannot work with them. You cannot fix a team. I mean, I don't like to work. I mean, they, usually don't use the word fixing. It feels that like something's wrong. It's about like, yeah. how can we build on what's already working? Each company has things that are not working and things that are working. When we focus on the what's not working, we're perpetuating the blame and the guilt and the negativity. It's not that we shouldn't address that, but it's also saying, hey, guys, we have a lot of great things going on. How can we make more of that? No? And build more of that. And why is that working? How can no? For example, in larger corporations, you always have those teams that are a little bit out of the norm. And they have a lot of great practices. They're not necessarily official. They're things that people figure out on their own and they're working. So how can bring those ways of working into a larger organization as well? That's building on the positive. And, and when you're building these in, in your circumstance, when you're sort of helping uh, these uh, teams and, you know, what, what is the average team size? Is it the seven number, which we hear many times, or is the is it bigger or smaller? What is what is what you would call an effective team to work with uh, uh, as as someone trying to sort of fix fix a team? What would you say is the uh, that that size? When it's designing a team, I would say the number is five plus two. No, so it's five between five and seven. That's the ideal team. Five, it's even better. I mean, it's like anything in life. If you have to go to the movies and you have to choose a movie. If you are three people, it's easy to find a movie. And if it's 10 people, you're never going to find yeah. the movie that yeah. everyone likes. Okay, But when it comes to transformation, usually we're dealing with larger teams. Because, I mean, I mean, we're working with 30, 50 people, or sometimes even hundreds of people at the same time. But, of course, in many of the activities, we break them in smaller groups. And, and when you start the fixing, and if it's a team of five to seven, and, and I know I'm, I'm just trying to sort of pinpoint this, do you work on relationships as a whole, as a, as a team whole, or do you sort of pick the battles through the project on sort of, uh, you know, one-to-one -one relationships? So you're looking at the CEO versus maybe one team member and then another one. So, so how, is, is, is building that, those relationships based on fixing the whole or by, by fixing the most strong relationships that exist there uh, before uh, uh, trying to fix the whole thing? Uh, we focus, I mean, we work on personal relationships, but not focusing on what, ah, if you don't get along with that person, because that usually gets things worse and you don't make any progress. We focus in the collective relationship as a team. We need to have a strong uh, uh, network. And I always tell people, and this is my approach, and for me it works. Some people say, ah, it shouldn't be that way. And I say, mm -hmm. it's okay that you don't get along with everyone. Mm -hmm. Many people say, no, you need to like everyone that works on your team. I say, I, I don't agree. And actually, when you remove the notion that you, because when people are forced to do something, usually they resist. You know? So people don't mm -hmm. resist change. They resist being changed. If I go mm -hmm. there and tell them, ah, you need to like all your team members. You need to have strong relationship with everyone. I say, why? I hate the guy. And okay. the paradox is that when you stop pushing for them to like everyone, then they stop fighting with that person. You know what I mean? That relationship is not maybe going to get strong, but at least they focus on something different. They focus on leverage your existing strong relationships. Maybe Gustavo and Bojan, you guys get along very well. Well, focus on that. How? What are the learnings from those strong relationships that you can apply to other relations that are weak? Right? 
how can you continue working as a team in spite of some relationships are broken or weak? No? So in the end, a, a team, it's not about a individuals, it's about like what's best for us as a group. So when people are focusing on the purpose of the team, what's our mission? What are we trying to achieve? What are our goals, metrics, and the challenge that is in front of us? Then they stop getting entangled in those one-to-one things because it's about the team. So, and 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 so when you sort of are thinking about setting up a team, um, so are you more about putting a lot of energy on the uh, front end of putting up a team, or are you sort of more to you know uh, actually a team a, a team is a living um, it's a living beast and and people come and go to some extent is you know because building relationships takes time and so you know if if you're building a long time and then it's dissolving all the time or you know because there's a lot of change in in the team itself are you sort of put more energy at the beginning get the right people in and then stick and, and work hard on making it work or are you sort of in in this camp of 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 being more flexible and 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 actually seeing that if it doesn't work some people will go some people will will come and you're sort of very flexible of on on the fluidity why I'm asking this is because you have to listen. We had a really great podcast with uh, Perry, um, uh, the Netflix uh, mm-hmm. lady, and and you know she 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 really she, she's really strong on on teamwork and teams, and 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 actually she talked about you know being team. It's 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 a it's an art where you constantly get people in and get people out because. You know, different people for different occasions, different people for different phases of, of the company. Um, and, and, and so there's this, it's not just the relationship, but it's this context of where you are. And, and, it's, and you, sh- you have to be open that it's not like everything has to be. Uh, uh, whereas with relationships, because I really do believe they're long term, you really put a lot of energy into making it work. So, so are you sort of in between? Are you one or do you just think that question is not a, a question at all? No, no, I think it's, I mean, I like your questions because they're, they're getting to very actual and, and, and deep issues that I observe usually and affect companies. The thing is, like, you know those models that are about forming, storming, norming, performing? Yeah, the, the, yeah. A, I don't know who created, I'm not against, I mean, Bruce Tuckman, whatever, in 1960-something. <laughs> and, and many companies use those models. And I think that approach, it's like if you were to design a team, develop a team, structure it, and then they're going to perform well. To your point, teams are fluid, yeah. right? They're changing all the time. That people, one day, they like each other. They, the next day, they hate. The people leave a job, then the new people. But also, one thing that's important, in the past, teams were more structured around departments and around particular projects. Today, we are building teams all the time that maybe this team is going to take care of a project, and then they're going to assemble, and then they... Sometimes you're part of two or three different teams within your organization. So uh, I'm more into the fluidity approach that you were mentioning because teams are always evolving. There are people leaving, the, 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 the vision of the team changes, so they're not as static and predictable as they used to be. You know? So I always say that teams are more like a jazz band, like a, a symphony, yeah. no? because the roles changing a leadership changing, they're improvising a lot, they're adapting a lot. So that dynamic is, for me, crucial. Going back to the questions, yes, relationships are long-term, but the important thing, even if one person leaves and another joins, all the thing that you build is going to immediately transfer to a new member because those the way that people embrace each other, their relationships, they're going to be prepared to adapt and adopt you know, <laughs> that new person in a much better way. I know our listeners because they ask me a lot of times. Uh, are there any tricks, you know, behind your sleeve uh, on on hiring? Is there anything, you know, there's a lot of books on that, but but is there anything that in, in your years in, in working with sort of teams you you discovered is a is sort of a good tactic of actually when you're hiring people that you can sort of see a little bit of of the future because you can't. Because, as you said, things change and, 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 and the context change and, and you discover people once they're within that context. You can't really discover them before that. But is there anything that really uh, our, our viewers or listeners would basically, um, 
you know get value from because you've seen some simple techniques work really well in in what most of our listeners think is a crucial element and that is when they're sort of selecting somebody because uh, most of the people I talk with actually understand selecting someone that means you're putting a lot of investment into sort of getting him integrated into the team and so on so so they they're trying to fix or not fix but improve that part of the um you know that part of the uh, uh, team building or team uh, nurturing uh, phase yeah absolutely i think that um, there are two things that when we're hiring people we're hiring two things one is skills you know so is this person going to be able to do a great job from a functional if you're looking for a coder a programmer like does they know the language is it good is it reliable that stuff but that's the thing that usually it's easy to measure. But then you're bringing a human being, right? So, and that comes with a lot of good things and a lot of problems. So the point is, it's easier to predict the problems that a person might bring to a table than the good things that are going to bring. You know? <laughs> so on one hand, I always say like when we are hiring people, people always talk about culture fit. I like to talk about culture fitness, you know? So it's important that a new hire is somehow or very much aligned with your company culture, but it's more important that you're going to allow that person also to challenge your culture. So it's kind of a cross-pollinization process. So the person needs to adapt to the culture and learn how we do things here, but we want the person also to influence us, to challenge us, to bring new tools, new ways of working, and so on and so on. So probably someone that is Susan Loop in our company comes to my team and I want them to adopt the tool. So it's that kind of stuff that works. It, the first thing that we want to avoid is assholes, you know, people that because of their personality are going to create a lot of friction that is unnecessary. So I always say there's positive friction that helps the team grow and there's friction because I'm egomaniac or what, clueless and hurts people. <laughs> the other thing is a huge mistake that most people do when hiring it's we uh, confuse charisma with competence so usually when we're interviewing two candidates and they both have a nice skill set and experience blah 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 the person that is the louder the most sensual the blah blah, blah gets hired and there's a lot of research that shows because we believe that someone that knows how to sell themselves well, it's a better professional. The reality, and there's a lot of research, and there's a great a, a book by, by Google's former a head of HR a, that basically talks about that, that says that charisma doesn't equate to performance. On the, other, on the contrary, most of the time, the people that are best selling themselves are lousy team members and lousy performers. So that's a first bias that mm -hmm. we need to also make sure that we... Uh, uh, also, a, a characteristic that we're looking a lot is people that are um, um, intellectually humble, right? We come from a... I mean, we've all been trained. I've been working for 30 years, and we've all been trained, not only in school and, and college, but, but also in, in our first jobs, to operate under the right or wrong mindset, No. And basically, we expect people to have all the answers and we expect people to know it all. In today's world, no one can know how to solve problems that we haven't figured, figured it out before. We need people that are, have the ability to understand and assume, okay, I don't know, but I'm going to find the answer. So most interviews are designed to show if the person has the answers. I think it's more important to test, are we hiring someone that it's courageous enough to say, I don't know that answer, but I'm going to find a solution to it versus trying to uh, impress us of how smart that person is. So I prefer wise and intellectual, humble people to smart people. In, in working again with your experience in, in, in teamwork and, and building these teams, tell me what was the stuff you consistently saw resulted in really big and transformational change. And I, and, and I know, you know, the, the whole idea about teams and the team, but is there any pattern of, you know, there's this click? I, and, and I know in this world there isn't a click, but there's a few. But is there anything special that you saw really, you know, make that 
on on a consistent basis and and when you come you came into an environment and you did that click or was it just in the end the team and the relationship of 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 the the sum of all the relationships when you got them to the next level the whole surrounding went went uh, one stage uh, beyond I think one one thing that clicked, I mean, Google did a lot of research on how to design and build a high-performing teams. And to your point before, they started testing the usual hypothesis. So number one, hire the best talents. It's not that you shouldn't hire great talent, but most of the time, when you hire best talent that are great as individuals, they're not necessarily great team members, right? And then they tested diversity of thinking, people that are more challenging versus people that are more open-minded, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, they got into this notion of what's called a psychological safety, which is the idea safety, yeah, yes. that it's the belief that the team as a whole, it's safe for us to take interpersonal risks. So I can speak up, mm -hmm. I can share my ideas, I can ask questions, I can say whatever comes to mind. And no one's going to silence me, ignore me, or criticize, or even punish me, like firing me for my job because of what I say. So that thing that I learned through studying and whatever, I observe it then in practice, which is critical. When teams feel that they are comfortable to talk within each other and they can uh, address tensions, then great things can happen. So in my practice, for example, one thing I realize, and we focus a lot on that, is we have to help people talk and address the issues that everyone, everyone's thinking, but no one is saying. So we were an exercise that, that's called the stinky fish. And basically, what's, what's the stinky fish? You know, that, that the, if you don't take care of it, not only it's going to get worse and worse, it's going to rot and it's going to start smelling, but it's going to poison the rest of the food on your fridge, right? So you have to do something about it. So you can ignore it for one, two days, but then it's going to get really, really uh, uh, bad. So uh, I think that the moment we ask people, or we, we do a lot of, ex because it's not asking, it's through exercise that people don't feel intimidated to start addressing those issues, that's when you see a complete change of behavior. Because when, once they cross that line, people say, ah, you know what? It's safe to speak up. And, and many times we have, as human beings, issues with other people, right? And because we don't address those issues, the emotions get really violent and, and big and whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about the problem, they say, ah, oh, it was just that little thing, you know? It doesn't hurt that much. Because you can name it, you can put it in front of everyone, and you can address it. So, uh, you know, we always ask some uh, also questions about, uh, you know, whoever we interview, and in this case, Gustavo. So who's driving the relationships at home? In what sense? Well, at, at your home, privately, who's who drives the relationship? Is it an equal, or is it the wife, or, or is it the, the children? How's the the the, the family relationships uh, develop? I think it depends on the matter, but overall, it's a it's a collective team, no? So I think that I put in try to put in practice what I what I teach other people. <laughs> and, and, and 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 your question is tricky because at home happens the worst, no? But but in the end, I would say that. What we practice at home, the way we manage our families is the way we manage our teams and vice versa, right? We cannot, I mean, the, we build a wall, but we're being influenced, right? It, it's interesting. I, I've been married. One of my few long-term projects is my, my, my relation with my wife because I like to change projects because I'm, I'm very into experimenting. But this is one of the few projects that have lasted over two decades or is lasting because it's still alive. And, and one of the things that, that basically help us a lot is this criteria that whenever there's an issue that we're facing, a challenge or a discussion, whatever, we adopt the 50-50 rule, right? That means that each of us has to accept that we have 50% of accountability, responsibility in on what happened and what needs to happen to fix the issue. So in that sense... Instead of saying, ah, even if someone knows that you did more or whatever, it doesn't matter. When you start with that approach, 50-50, you basically focus on what's your 50 that you need to correct versus on blaming the other person. I coach this rule to teams as well. You know? Two people are fighting and say, well, you have 50% of the responsibility and you have 50, I don't want to use the word guilt because you feel like, oh, blame. 
and you have 50% mm -hmm. of the accountability. Go figure it out, work on your part, then get together and how are you going to solve it? So it's important because you move from blaming, we always see what the other person does wrong and we're always perfect because we're humans, right? Mm -hmm. To, okay, and their way around doesn't work either to think, oh, I'm, I'm the, the worst person on earth and everything's because of me. That doesn't, I mean, that the feeling doesn't help either. So uh, assuming that each person, when there's a two-way relation, has exactly half of the accountability, it's a nice way to, for you, to your point, to fix that who's driving the ship or, or the family. <laughs> But I like, I, I, I will uh, use it for, for the end, but I really like the, uh, you know, what has really changed in the last, and I totally believe that. And what has really changed, I, I, I you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the best at it, but I, I really do passionately believe that uh, what has changed is uh, you used to have a leader. Now you have a, a you know, you have a world winning team. It's, it's like the, 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 the leadership has changed to, the team, it's, it's, it's a team thing. Everything has to be a team thing. It, it can't be an individual making. Uh, uh, and, and, and the 50-50 rule, I, I get it in that context. And, and it's a very clever uh, sort of way of focusing towards the future instead of the, you know, the, the, the past, as I call it. Because the, the, the big challenge with teams is um, the relationships many times need the post-mortem to clean up. And then you're in the past too much time and not in the future mm -hmm. enough time, uh, as, as, as I would yeah. say, uh, as the big risk. Um, and what do you do uh, privately? What, is, what do you like, uh, you know, the books you read? Uh, what, what, does, what does Gustavo do when he's not uh, talking about uh, teams and cultures and relationships? I read books about teams and cultures. <laughs> <laughs> so which one, if that is the case, uh, tell me that, which, which one do you read? Which one I read? I mean, uh, I read a lot of books. So let me. Which one would you say you know is closest to what you really believe in? I I, I don't know. Do you know Ich Ichik? Sorry, Adizas, Adizas. Do you know Ichik Adizas? Yeah. He's a very yeah. well known. Uh, so you know, I uh, he's he's sort of uh, what kind of he's very close to what I believe in. You know, integrated teams as 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 the. As, as, as a way of actually surviving any kind yeah. of situation is, is the only way. Is there anybody that you sort of really like uh, as, as uh, a writer or author that is closest to you? Yeah, it's a book called Liberating Structures. I cannot remember the name of the author, and unless you want me to go and pick it from the library. No, no. And, uh, and basically, uh, there are two guys, I think one is French and the other one American, that develop a lot of tools. I use many of them in, in my workshops and, and consulting that there are small tools that help change behavior in a very simple and dramatic way. And I like the notion of liberating structures. No, I mean, it's a just chance that, I'm, that my firm is called Liberationist and that, <laughs> it's just coincidence, right? But in the end, I think the approach is similar, which is the end of uh, giving people the, the freedom and autonomy to solve their own problems, no? I usually, I don't like the word, the word empowerment. The other day I was giving a, a leadership program. People saying, well, we need to empower employees. And I say, no, because empowering means that you have the power and you're giving people the power. People have the power. You just need to give them freedom for them to unleash their power. No, they're not like kids that the mm -hmm. fathers, I'm going to give you the authority. No, people give their own authority. So in that sense, this book is really great. It's basically... Lots of tools and exercises that are very, very simple to to implement and really drive change. They approach change more like a conversation. You know? So for me, change is not a top-down approach. It's something that needs to happen organically. So uh, what happens is like provide people with different tools, let them test them, let's see what works, and then they can adopt them and they can use it to become better as individuals and team members. You no. Know? How, do you, how did you say the book is called Liberated, Liberating Structures? Li Liberating Structures. Perfect. Okay. Uh, wh where, can I, where can our viewers, listeners actually contact you? Where, where Are you online? Which parts of online do you most uh, react to? Because, you know, many of our listeners ask us in the end, so yeah. how can I get in touch? Sure. Uh, my website is liberationist.org. And there they can not only learn about what we do, but also I have a, a link that's called resources, 
and they can find a lot of tools and exercises and, and download some free ebooks and a lot of war, uh, stuff. Uh, I also have my blog there, so I have over 400 articles on change leadership and team building with also exercises and theory, a little bit of everything. And I'm very active on LinkedIn. So if you look for Gustavo Rossetti, I don't think there are many, so it's going to be easy to, to find me. I'm in <laughs> Chicago. And then on Twitter and Medium. And Medium, I, uh, I mean, I used to write a lot on Medium. Now I'm focusing on my personal blog. And then I write on, I, we post content on Medium, Psychology Today, and other websites as well. So we always uh, finish up with also uh, a simple question is, um, do you have any questions for us, for me? Uh, I was going to mention something because I got into, I, I, I make a joke that I was reading books, but I also do a lot of stuff on, on my personal time that basically uh, energizes me as a person, but also helps me reflect about my, my work as well, which I'm an avid uh, biker. So I, I like to go with my road bike and, and ride hundreds of miles every, every, every month. I also like to cook. Uh, that's one of my hobbies. I've been cooking since I was 10. And I like to cook for my friends, anything from, I don't know, Vietnamese, French, Italian, Spanish food, whatever. Like, a, So I like to try. I like to experiment with different types of cuisines. And, 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 and for me, it's my therapy, but also my way of uh, entertaining my family or my, my friends as well. So, uh, Gustavo, thank you. It was a very uh, valuable um you know, half an hour, um, I would uh, uh, recap it by saying I, I loved your entry, which was, uh, I think, uh, a few minutes after we started talking and you talked about sort of uh, uh, leadership has changed and it's not about the individual leader, you know, teams have uh, the authority, the responsibility to lead as, as, as a team. And, and, and that's why um, relationships in those teams are, are so important. And uh, if there's anything I learned about you, you like uh, experimenting and doing a lot of things, uh, both uh, in your private life and, and uh, uh, business-wise. Uh, so um, thank you again. And uh, it was a very, very nice uh, podcast. Thank you. I was thank you for your time and glad to be part of your podcast.